Good day, Internet. It is a beautiful Sunday right now in uh, Dunstaffenage, PEI, and I feel like it's a great time to do a little update video on how the RX-7 has been working. Uh, long story short, things been working awesome. I've put about 2,000 kilometers on this in the last month, which was about five or six tanks of fuel, so I've just been driving this any chance I get. Damn near dailying this thing. Haven't been exclusively driving it, but I've been driving it any time that it's nice out and not raining. So similar to a video I did about a year ago, I made a list of things that I want to go over. Uh, as with any giant project that has lots of moving parts, like it's a new fuel pump, it's a new fuel lines, it's a new like everything. Uh, we pretty much built the powertrain of this car and uh, with anything that is built by hand, there's a couple of interesting quirks and features that I would like to go over. So let's uh, dive right on in. So let's start off with the concerning news. It is maybe burning a little bit of sump oil. Obviously it's meant to burn the premix oil that goes into the gas tank, but it is going down on the stick. In about, I'd say like two or three tanks of gas, it will go from the high mark to the low mark, which is not quite what I was hoping for. It is leaking from the oil cooler. If you remember from the last video, I talked about the oil cooler leaking really bad and then I fixed it and I fixed it like most of the way, but it is indeed leaking oil slowly. And this was just at like idle moving it into the into the ghetto garage. When I'm actually driving it on the road, it's probably consistently dripping at a pretty decent rate. So I need to figure out where that's coming from on the oil cooler. Right now I have shop towels zip tied onto the lines because I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. But yeah, there, that's a really good visual on uh, the problem. It may actually be the drain plug that you're looking at right there. I may have, hopefully I didn't crack any aluminum. Hopefully I just need to replace the crush washer and that's that. So that's the thing. It's not chewing through oil like crazy, but it's more than I would like to see. But hopefully we fix that and then there's no more oil consumption. So what else do we got? We got a new muffler on it. So last episode was loud as hell. It is less loud now. So let's take a gander. gander. There is our new muffler. Oh yeah, in the last episode, I said that I was gonna put a glass pack muffler on it. I did my research after I purchased that and then I immediately returned it to the store because rotaries burn hot enough and they shoot the exhaust out fast enough that they will destroy a glass pack muffler 100%. So what we have here is a Racing Beat Universal two and a half inch piping pre-silencer designed for a rotary and it has stainless steel packing in it. And it has done a perfect job of reducing the car's noise level uh, to something a little bit more appropriate. So it, I'm still really happy with the sound. And uh, I can almost go through drive throughs and, and hear them at the speaker, almost. But I've driven past a number of uh, police officers and they have uh, not cared about it. So that's awesome. While we're talking about the exhaust, here's a funny thing. So we got our awesome rotor muffler back here, right? So whenever I built the exhaust setup 2.0 that has the stainless steel two and a half inch piping, I left about, I hope this isn't too, too hot. No, not really. I left about a quarter inch between the bodywork here and the muffler. So the funny thing is whenever this gets up to temperature, so obviously I did that when it was cold, when it heats up to full temperature, it expands so much that it smashes the muffler into the bodywork. See that? That's not supposed to be bent out like that. The muffler does that. So see how there's a gap right now? When the car heats up, there is no gap and it rubs against it. So that's a little bit of an issue. It's minor enough. I'm not going to do anything right this second, but that's kind of funny. So I really just need to make it a tiny bit shorter. It didn't expand that much last year, probably because there wasn't nearly as much heat coming out from the engine, but we got a uh, we got a ported 13B now compared to a stock 12A. She shoots out the exhaust pretty good. I am one last thing before we move on from exhaust things. 
this unfortunately is the lowest point on the car, like considerably. See that? Whenever I did my original placement of the exhaust piping, I made sure that it was nice and tucked under there, see? But this was kind of an afterthought. And even if it wasn't an afterthought, there's not really a lot of room for it down there to not sag down like this. So even on regular speed bumps sometimes, I crunch this on it. And it makes me cringe extremely hard because this thing wasn't that cheap. Uh, and it's, you know, it's just a nice thing that I don't want to destroy. So I think I'm going to, sooner than later, make a little skid plate for it and weld it on. Just so that it's not speed bumped directly against thin stainless steel. I wish that this could be tucked up under there better, but I don't know. Maybe I'll fix that at some point in life, but right now it's just a, it's just a quirk. Oh yeah, the hyper flashing. Uh, this isn't really that exciting of a thing, but I put LED bulbs in it and now my turn signals hyper flash and I get a weird thing on the dash whenever I hit the brake. Uh, it's not gonna do it if the key's not in, hold on. Let me show you what it does. Do I have to actually start the engine to demonstrate this? The stop lamp light goes on when I hit the brake and also the turn signals go really fast, like that. So there's multiple ways that you can fix this. The kind of crappy way to do it is to take resistors and put them in parallel with each bulb of the car. Uh, that's kind of crappy because you're putting LEDs in so that it pulls less power and then you're making it pull more power in order to trick the ECU into not thinking that there's no bulbs in it at all. So we're gonna dig into that at a future date. I already bought the part that I need to fix the hyper flashing. It is basically a relay, uh, a flasher relay that goes in here, I believe, or under the dash somewhere, that replaces the one that does the hyper flashing. It's not gonna be that hard, but it's a, it's a bit of a wiring job. And for the stop lamp light coming on because of the brake lights, I'm just gonna snip whatever light goes to that, that thing. And we're gonna call that good. But for now, it's very ignorable. Okay, now onto something actually cool. Check this out. Check out that oil cap, yo. That is a Franklin Performance rotary oil cap in short uh, oil fill stem. And then I've got a little K&N filter hooked onto the breather, so that's how the uh, crank case ventilates whenever the oil chamber expands it breathes through that Previously, I had this covering up my beautiful 13b Mazda artwork and now it is not doing that anymore So that's partially why I wanted uh, a different oil. Well, I could have done that with the stock oil cap, but I digress I wanted the short one because it looks sweet and this is the coolest looking oil cap I've ever seen the center part is a separate piece of metal so you can rotate, and it's just held on with double-sided tape, so you can rotate it however you want. So I've kind of chosen it to look like that. Also, while we're talking about aesthetic things, the, what do you call this? The flywheel inspection cover plate that came off both of the engines were quite pitted, so I decided to make my own out of some stainless steel, and I even signed it, because I'm honestly pretty proud of this whole thing. So, Giles Vesey. Look at how full of myself I am. Signing my own engine build. Oh, another another unplanned uh, aesthetic engine bay thing. Finally got rid of the ratchet strap on the battery. We're not having this uh, fly into the engine again like we did last year. And I got this off of Amazon.ca for 16 Canadian dollars and it's anodized aluminum and it's like really nice looking and I'm just thrilled about that. 16 bucks. Hopefully it doesn't snap in half, but I'm pretty pretty happy with that. All right, the timing. So I don't know, well, I sort of know a little bit about timing on older engines now. Uh, I didn't know what a timing light was or how it works. If you've never used a timing light before, I'll try and explain this in a way that you'll understand. What a timing light is, is a thing that looks like a gun. It's this thing and it has one function. You push the button and it, shoots light out of this lamp whenever the spark plug fires. So it gives you like a stop motion view of what the timing is like 
what where the timing marks are when the spark plug fires. And that tells you visually what is going on. Hey, the timing mark just happens to be right there. I think that's one of the timing marks and not just not just a pit. Is it? And maybe it's just a pit. Uh, but there's a lot of a lot of talk online about what people do with timing on bridge ported engines, and mine's only a half bridge port, and I don't want to push it too far or anything. But I do want to make sure that the timing isn't uh, super retarded. That's the one time I'm allowed to use that word, is when I'm talking about timing. So, uh, what we did is we disconnected the vacuum advance system. So here's a little bit of a little bit of explanation on the distributor setup. There's other videos that'll go into way more detail about this, but there's a vacuum advance setup that's using these pots that are hooked up to the carburetor in the ported vacuum port. So the different so on carburetors, there's a port, usually just one, that is specific to this function that is before the butterflies. And the vacuum behaves differently whenever you pull from right before the butterflies versus after. Like everything else on the engine that has a vacuum source, like the brake booster and stuff, that is manifold vacuum. But this is ported vacuum, which is specific to this function. The main thing is that it doesn't fully advance the timing at idle. That's the main thing. I won't go into more detail than that because that's about the extent of my understanding. But there's a vacuum advance system. There's also a centrifugal advance system, which is built into the carburetor. You can't see it because it's in there, but there's like a centrifugal thing that comes out the faster that this spins. And by about 4,000 engine RPM-ish, it is advanced fully. So what I did is I disconnected the vacuum system I revved the engine up to 4,000 RPM. I looked at the marks. Uh, if I want to explain this properly, I should probably turn the engine over. One second. Okay, so I spun it around. So that little white dot that you see on the right, that is a dot that I made, and that, that indicates 20 degrees of timing before top dead center. Where And what that's relative to is the pin. You see that little pin that's sticking out of the engine that's pointing at it? Uh, that is that is the indicator that you're lining up against. So where it's pointing right now is exactly top dead center. So what you want to see whenever you have the timing light on this, when you're revving it up to like 4,000, 5,000 RPM to get past this centrifugal advance, is that you're getting to uh, your desired timing amount. So I chose 22 degrees of leading and about 17 degrees of trailing timing advance. So I made sure that it was hitting that. So I got it on the leading just a little bit past that white mark and on the trailing a little bit before that white mark. It's I wasn't super exact about it, but I don't think there's anything super duper exact about any of this, to be honest. It's a distributor. So after doing that, honestly, it's been driving pretty much the same, possibly a little bit better. Hard to tell, but it certainly didn't negatively impact anything. By the way, uh, how you adjust those things, how you adjust the leading timing or like the base timing is using this. So it used to be there. You can see the witness mark. So I really didn't move it that much. Uh, I moved it that much, which advanced it just a little bit more to get a little bit more out of the, the bridgey. And then to make the split between leading and trailing larger, you move this guy. So I loosen those screws and moved it so that the split was closer. People online, everything that I'm talking about here is just stuff that I read on forums and in the service manual and everywhere online, just from all the research that I did. So people were saying, try like a five degree split. So I, I found that moving this over like pretty much all the way gave me roughly a five degree timing split by the time this centrifugal advance is done doing its thing. Some people on race engines, they will delete the centrifugal advance because it's it's just another variable and usually they're revved up all the time, but this is not a race engine. This is something that I drive around town, so I'm definitely not deleting the vacuum advance or the centrifugal advance. I just wanna make sure that by the time I'm singing up high in the RPMs, the timing is something somewhat sensible. So uh, I think that's all I need to ramble about that. 
Oh yeah, I also built a uh, sick ass cold air intake for it. Check that out. This is completely overkill. Absolute ridiculous overkill for an engine that makes like 200, maybe 230 horsepower. This is four inch intake piping, aluminum, using like silicone couplers and stuff. And I just wanted it to look really cool. I'm kind of envious of all uh, the boosted cars with nice engine bays that have these giant pipes. Well, I wanted to put a giant pipe on this. And also this thing, which is, I can't choose the output size of this. My, my perfect carb hat only comes in a four inch output which is fine. So I just kept doing four inch. I didn't want to do a reducer or anything and make it look wonky. Uh, it's just a big ass friggin' intake. So what it does is it hooks up to this 90 degree coupler that I have cheesed a little bit to make it more like a 110 degree coupler. I did some trimming on it to kind of bend things more to my will. And then it's going into the radiator tunnel and the filter is inside the rad tunnel. And I'll show you that in a second. And originally I was just going to have it metal on metal. And then I thought, this thing's gonna be vibrating constantly all the time. This is aluminum, this is steel. It's gonna wear through it eventually. So this rubber thing, like, so I had to find like a four inch rubber O-ring gasket grommet thing. And I just happened to have a K&N intake, or not K&N intake, K&N filter that was dirty. I was about to throw it out. And I took the rubber piece off of it. So. Basically, instead of the metal of the filter, it's the metal of my radiator tunnel. So this thing is not going anywhere. I couldn't pull it out if I wanted to. It is, uh, there's like a lip on the other side. And uh, it looks pretty nice. Looks pretty factory, if you ask me. And then you come down here and you see our big ass mother effing filter. Look at that. The wiring right now is not that glorious, but it's, it's floating there. It's happy. It's not touching anything that it doesn't need to that it shouldn't so that was a fun little project how much is it really going to matter that it's getting slightly colder air on a na engine and eh, maybe a little bit more so on hot days and speaking of hot days was that pretty much the end of our list now oh, the fuel pump noise and eh, we'll get to that in a second so today is actually pretty warm i've been waiting for a warm day to test out something kind of ridiculous that i'm giving a shot at Check out this bad boy. So I hate sweating my nuts off, but I love driving the RX-7 and I also love summer. Uh, so there are some months throughout the year where like last year it was just too hot and I would not take this car out because it's got no air conditioning. So I wanted some solution that didn't involve me like figuring out how to install AC in this car because that would be expensive and fidgety and the engine bay wouldn't be as clean as it is right now. and I just don't really want to. So we're trying this. And if it doesn't end up working, I'm not going to be heartbroken. I just thought it was a cool idea. This is an air conditioner that runs on ice cubes. So I got this idea and this design from another guy on YouTube. If you look up, if you look up uh, ice cooler air conditioner, his videos will come up and you'll see where I got the idea from. But basically, it's got a blower on the intake. It shoves air into the cooler. You have a bunch of ice sitting on top of this chicken wire grate shelf thing. Like you have a lot of ice in here and it pumps the air below the ice and the air has to come through the ice as like a filter before it comes out the top. So I built this kind of in the, in the spring and we haven't gotten any really sweaty days yet, but I'm kind of sweating right now, honestly. So maybe later in the afternoon, we'll throw this in the back of the car. Maybe I'll close all the windows like it would be if I were like parked at work or something like that. And uh, we'll let it get nice and hot. We'll throw this in the back. It runs off the car's power and we'll see how well it does. I did one test run with this before I had speed control and that makes a huge difference. So I've got speed control on it now. Before it was going all 270 CFMs of super hot, air in the car there's just one random day a couple weeks ago where i brought this with me to work right after i made it and the car was boiling hot and at full speed it burned through three bags of gas station ice in like 15 minutes it was kind of impressive how fast it melted it because it was just shoving the air through as fast as possible yeah it was nice and cold coming out it worked but i need it to last longer than that so now with some speed control 
Uh, we're gonna see hopefully how effective this is at cooling off my skinny butt. And the fuel pump noise. So the fuel pump is loud. That's to be expected. It's it's a 60 PSI fuel pump, but it sounds to me like there are bubbles in the fuel. It just sounds like that to me. It sounds kind of inconsistent. It just sounds like there's there's probably air getting into the system. So I was using just those spring style clamps on all of the tubing that was pre high pressure filter, sorry, high pressure pump. And uh, I must have one of those chilling around here somewhere. Just so you know what I'm talking about. Are you kidding me? And there we go, there's one. I was just using these on everything before the filter and my theory was that that was allowing air to get sucked in because the pump is, is pulling pretty hard. It's gonna pull negative pressure on all of the piping before the pump. I was wondering if it was introducing air bubbles because I was just using these and these really aren't that great. So I got fuel injection clamps and I put those on last night and this is weird. I haven't figured this out yet. So I put that on last night and I started the car up. Well, I didn't start the car up. I turned the car on so I could hear the fuel pump run and it sounded awesome. It sounded so clean and just quiet and it was just a nice little low hum. And I was like, sick, we fixed it. And then this morning I turned it on, sounded great. Started the car up, went for a drive, shut it off, turned it on again and it was loud again. So I don't know what's up with that. So maybe, Maybe it's just aeration inside of the fuel itself that's making that noise. Let me show you what it sounds like. It'll probably be loud right now if I turn it back on. Maybe one of my clamps got loose, I have no clue. Here, I'm just gonna set you right above where the fuel pump is so you can hear it real good. No, that sounds really good. No, that's what I want it to sound like. No, nah, that's weird. That's weird. That sounded that sounded good. That's what I wanted it to sound like. But we will go for a drive at the end of this vid in just a minute. And uh, we'll see what it sounds like as we're driving around. And I'll, hopefully you'll be able to hear what I'm talking about. semi-cold start for you. It was already pretty warm. The exhaust thump is so powerful that it's shaking this glass against my window. I don't think your stock 12A will do that. Maybe if it was straight piped. That's funny. Also, speaking of oil related things, I don't think this is anything to be worried about, but if I let it idle for a long time, such as whenever it's warming up, and then I go and I give it some gas as I'm leaving somewhere, it will frequently shoot out a pretty decent amount of, of oil, of blue smoke out the back. But I think that's just the premix kind of accumulating on the walls of the combustion chambre. And then whenever there's actually some more angry combustion, it kind of blows the cobwebs out and burns all that stuff off. So I'm gonna give it a, a blip right now and let's see if it does it. I've never done this before, but I've thought about it. I'm gonna set the tripod up by the highway and I'm gonna record myself leaving. 
Then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna see if the fuel pump is loud compared to being quiet. Hopefully that was at least sort of cool. So here's here's how the air conditioner looks when it's set up. It takes up a fair bit of space back there. But I just turned it on for the first time with actual speed control on a day where it actually calls for it. And it seems to be pretty frosty in there so far. So we're just going to leave it on with all the windows closed and enjoy the air conditioning in our 1983 RX-7 without air conditioning. Okay, so I don't need to stop the car and start it again. You hear that? So yeah, the fuel pump gets really loud. And like, as you're driving around, as the fuel is sloshing around, it kind of makes different noises and it's fine if that's how it's supposed to be. I just want to make sure that mine's not sucking in air for no reason. Also, if you notice my oil pressure, uh, I was originally quite concerned about that, how it idle, it goes to like pretty much zero. But I did some reading on the forums and it turns out that these, these gauges, it is not a mechanical gauge. It has a sender unit and then it gets turned into electricity and then it gets turned back into the gauge moving uh, they're really faulty lots and lots and lots of people have reported on their FBs that these gauges do basically what mine is doing just reading really low hopefully I'm not gonna eat my words and my engine isn't making terrible oil pressure but at some point I'm gonna put a mechanical gauge on it and verify that it is actually not that low it used to be fine when I first started driving this engine. It showed like four all the time, which is what it's supposed to be when you're like cruising around slash giving it the beans. But, uh, and then at idle, it should be like two. But right now mine is like, not two. By there, it should be like three or four. And it's not. So I think the gauge is faulty. So many people have talked about their gauge is not working right that I'm not surprised to see that my gauge isn't working right. So I'm not, gonna stop driving it because of that hopefully it's not a huge mistake but I don't hear any weird noises or anything the oil level is fine I've been checking it every time that I drive it because of the oil consumption issue so it's fine also this is nice and cool right now blowing on me maybe I'll turn it up a little bit more I should show you what I put in there for ice what, how you put the ice in there, like how finely it's chopped up makes a pretty big difference. I assume. I say that like I have experience with this thing. So I put in one giant block surrounded by a bunch of bullet ice cubes made by an ice cube maker that I bought for this purpose. So this thing cost me about 200 Canadian bucks and then the ice maker was like 150 bucks. And uh, yeah, not too huge of an investment. That was a good brap. That was a good brap, my friend. All right, let's go for a little rip and finish this video off. So as I mentioned, uh, we got quite a bit of driving onto this car. So that number, 980 kilometers, add 1,070 to that. And you've got how many kilometers are on the new engine. So like 2,000, which is quite a bit. I've been really enjoying driving this thing around. Also, I got this thing mounted somewhere proper now. I really like this placement. 
I 3D printed a little plate to go on top of the clock. I really like the clock. The clock is cool, but it's not as cool as this. So I decided to, to place this here and rev the cable through the boot. Also, I got this boot off of uh, a friend of mine, an, an RX-7 friend that I just know online, Matthias Motors. Sold me this from his parts car and I'm thrilled with it. Things in really good shape. So finally, my interior is like pretty much complete. We need to do something cool back there with the uh, the back carpet. Right now that's like the most unfinished part of the car, but it's fine. So I 3D printed a, a piece of plastic to fit over that hole where the clock is. And then I used some 3M dual lock and the dual lock is actually way too strong. So this is like semi-permanently installed here. If I try, I wanted this to be removable, but if I try and remove it, it is actually so strong that it will like split the sniper screen apart. So I'm trying to not have to take this off. But anyway, I really like having it there. In the last video, this thing was still in the process of getting broken in. I don't think you guys got to hear over 4,000 RPM. Well, now we're bringing it right to eight sometimes. I'm very reluctant to take it any further than that. I actually don't plan on taking it further than eight really ever. Because it's already a lot of fun going up to that speed and some weird shit can start to happen after 8,000 RPM. We're playing it safe and we're just taking it to eight. Most of the time, 75. <laughs> Maybe I take that back. I think that extra bit of timing helped out. That felt pretty juicy. Not gonna lie. you couldn't really have a conversation with them. Now you can. The extra muffler did exactly what I wanted it to. Woo! Okay, that was eight. There's a there's an 8,000 RPM pull in second gear for you, YouTube. Conditioning is still cold. that was borrowing it. Now that this car is actually fast, I kind of want to throw it around some corners a bit more. And the front fender's rubbing like that is a bit of a bummer, so I'm gonna see if I can fix that. It's on a nice little Sunday drive, boy.
having this little road like directly outside of my house is pretty wicked for just going for a quick little rip in a car if you enjoy driving like I do. It's a nice little scenic road through the trees. Occasional speed bump like that one. That's what you get on good old Prince Edward Island. Especially in the spring. I guess it's, I think we just got out of spring. Technically we're into summer now. <laughs> oh, I love this thing, man. This thing is so good. Okay, I think both of these work roads lead to dirt. We're pulling a Eugene. Second gear is where all the fun is at, in my opinion. Second gear in this thing rips. And third gear rips too, but I don't know if I've ever gotten to the top of third gear. You're going pretty friggin' fast. The gears in this are honestly a bit long. Like, whenever you rev out to eight, the next gear, you're kind of down back at like four or something. Let me make sure I'm not lying to you. it past the children playing sign. I'm not a total monster. I'll wait until we're past it. Yeah, like 45. Yeah, you're, you're still in the power band, but I wish you were still in the power band a little bit more. Where the power band in this is just more equals better. More RPM equals more. I wonder if I can circulate the coal better if I turn this to recirculate and then turn the fan on. Will that make anything better? Will it be cold coming out of here? Not really. Not yet anyway. We'll give it a shot. With this, my air conditioning can continue to run with the engine off. Okay, so after that little drive, how are we doing for ice cubes? Did we melt the entire thing? Ah, fair bit of it. Uh, the center block is fairly untouched, which is not surprising to me. Didn't go through all of it or anything, but a fair bit. So probably, yeah, one giant slab in the middle is probably not smart. Probably better to take that and smash it up a little bit first. And then have like a bunch of big chunks and a bunch of small chunks. Cause you're trying to make a filter basically. You're trying to make a filter made out of ice cubes that air goes through. I think you can hear, can you hear the dripping right now? I can hear it. It's dripping water down into the bottom chamber as all this ice melts, as I'm forcing hot air through it, but working okay that would have been a very sweaty drive had I left all the windows up without this thing going so does go through ice decently quick but not a total failure another couple little tidbits before we close this vid off check out what I did here so I kind of cleaned out the ghetto garage and I put down a new tarp uh, for the floor so we got a new heavy-duty tarp uh, the old one was absolutely disgusting 
And, uh, yeah, it's the whole vibe in here is just a whole lot better. And I had an idea. And this was that idea. Uh, I didn't even plan on doing this whenever I took the old tarp off. But I was like, hmm, let's give that a try. So I dug this down. It is exactly made for the size of this wooden board. And the jack goes under there. And it is pretty much under floor level. And it is in the perfect place where if I pull the Arc 7 in straight, the... Uh, cross member that's right underneath the engine is like right there and if i pull it in backwards the pumpkin is like right there so depending on what side of the car i want to jack up i just pull it in one way or the other and uh, this thing's awesome and also on my speed three one of my other cars it can jack up uh the subframe as well by the way uh, i feel like i kind of have to mention this uh the arc 7 is doing great my master speed three is doing less great this season uh we had a little bit of a whoopsie so maybe I'll maybe I'll do a video series on repairing this disaster. But long story short, I took it to the drag strip and it overboosted for some reason. And and uh, yeah, yeah. So I just kind of shelved that for now. The the speed three is in this tent right now, and we'll get to that whenever we get to that. But for the summer, I'm just gonna focus on the RX-7 and enjoying that. Eh? 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 So I just drove it straight in. And now the jack can meet up with Mr. Subframe. Ow, I just smashed my thumb. Don't worry about it. Now I can jack the front end up pretty much as high as I reasonably want. Love that. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of this thing so far. The only downsides are that where it's diagonal here like this going down into the pit, you can't put jack stands there. And if you want to like lay down right there, it's really awkward because you're falling into the pit. But I think the upsides weigh out the downsides. And just because we're on a little bit of a roll today, uh, we're going to play around with the fenders. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm going to try and take this and pull it out towards me just a little bit so that this rubs less. Because I can just barely get my fingers in there. And it's not horrendous, but you can see there's some feathering right there where it's rubbing. And the paint under there is a little bit upset. I did roll this already, so it's pretty much at an angle like that. It's just, it needs to be pulled now. So it's been rolled, but now it needs to be pulled. And what I, I got my fender roller back, but what I think I want to actually try is shoving a book in there. Because that's going to conform to exactly where the interference is happening. And uh, it's just kind of an old trick that I want to give a try. So I'm going to heat this up nice and good jack it up a tiny bit, throw various thickness books in there, and see what happens. All right, the good news is that actually using the fender roller and not shoving a book under there actually did manage to move where this fender ends. And I rolled the lip under there a little bit more. The bad news is that I did bake in this fender just a little bit. It used to be nice and uniform, and now it is a little bacony. So I may be able to fix that 
at some later point in time. But right now I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side and I honestly don't know what I'm gonna do differently because uh, I am doing something relatively aggressive to it. I'm trying to pull the metal out to fit over my, my wheels that I've chosen. It's not that bad, but it's gonna annoy me just a little bit because I know that I did that. Not the end of the world. This, fen this fender needs to get some paint at some point in its life. Look at that. Still, that's like the original rock chipping that was on this car when I got it in the first place. So this thing's gonna need some love at a future point in time. So, yeah, still pretty happy with it. This right now is, uh, the coilover is all the way down and before this would absolutely be hitting and it's actually not hitting. Uh, I could probably fit two or three business cards in there, or like credit cards in there. So we're gonna go do the same thing to the other side, which I don't think I'm going to record. But whenever I'm done of that, we'll go for another rip and uh, we'll throw it around some roundabouts and we'll see if we're sm we're still smacking our fender and our wheel. All right, we have rolled the fenders, we have put the wheels back on, we have torqued them so that I don't die. Let's see if that made any difference at all. It is just barely starting to rain right now, but I don't care. I do enjoy not having to worry about the choke anymore. If you remember, I was using a pair of mini vise grips in order to hold the choke out because the auto choke didn't work. Well, now we don't got to worry about that at all. soon but I haven't heard any rubbing yet and normally like we wrapped around those roundabouts we're gonna run it we're gonna hit this one fast Let's see if we get the rubber dub dub in the tub I think we're happy with that I heard it rub probably on the inner fender liner it didn't sound like normal rubbing from between metal and rubber. It sounded like probably plastic. We are much happier with that. Nice. All right, that's just about it for this video. If you made it this far, here's one last little bit of candy for you. That's about it for this vid. I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Oh.